This project combines operations research and life sciences. Merck Sharp & Dome is a pharmaceutical company that produces healthcare products for humans, but also for animals. Biomanufacturing is seen by lots of people an unpredictable process. Bioprocess manufacturing for us is leading in our business to vaccines that we would like to make more predictable. With a predictable output, we can give promises towards our customers. This is what you're going to get at that time point. And that stability is really required in getting a customer satisfaction. We have a huge variety of products and each product has its own recipes and uh, its own complexities. We have a lot of data, but how can we actually use this data in our advantage? The real world data from MST is used as an input to the optimization model. We use machine learning, simulation-based optimization to predict and control these processes. The optimization model also translated the underlying biological dynamics into business metrics, such as throughput, lead time and cost. The, the quantifiable results are related to increase in yield and a decrease in uh, variation in the yield. And savings that we have with the multiple projects that we implemented are going up to 50 million reduction each year. The collaboration with the Technical University was really hands-on, which means that we had internships going on within the company, so a full occupation within the department, weekly meetings with the Technical University at the company as well. They never hesitated to perform test runs, so we could actually validate our assumptions and our models. We will avoid investments, we will become more predictive, leading to a cost reduction, leading to uh, more capacity on our production lines, meaning that we can make this world a better place. The biomanufacturing industry is the industry which focuses on the production of complex drugs. In these complex drugs, you have to think about vaccines, hormones, and proteins such as insulin. And those drugs are then used in the treatment of cancer, autoimmune diseases, and such. The challenge in this lies in the predictability of the production process. In these biomanufacturing um, uh, processes, uh, most often a biological system is used. You can imagine with, for example, cells or bacteria or viruses growing, a lot of components are used, therefore a lot of input variables. And with a lot of input variables, a production process is then uh, tending to be much more variable. Then if we look specifically to the animal health industry, we have a high pressure on improving our efficiency. Um, Currently, the supply is not sufficient to meet the worldwide demand due to a growing uh, protein demand in the food industry. And if you would look at the requirements or the regulatory requirements, the animal health industry has the same requirements as the human health industry, but the margins are a lot lower, as you can imagine for yourself. If you would uh, produce a vaccine for, for example, a chicken, which will uh, be costing $15, then uh, the chicken you buy in the store will be much, much more expensive. And it's not what uh, one is willing to pay. So therefore we need to, to be able to produce the same quality vaccine for a much, much lower price, often just a few cents per dose. So that means that we have to be much more inventive and, and improving our efficiency to be cost effective. So this is a way uh, of, to achieve this. We are partnering with the Technical University in Eindhoven. And um, we are partnering with the facility that we have in Boxmeer. In Boxmeer, we both have the R&D and the manufacturing. And for the past four years, we had a very effective collaboration. And if we we're going to look at the, uh, the implementations that we have done so far, um, we, uh, are facing currently about a 50 million euro saving a year. We achieved this by building up a specific portfolio of decision support tools. Uh, a few of them are presented on this slide. Uh, the bleed feed, which is a hybrid model, uh, the yield optimization tool, and a rhythm wheel tooling. 
which is a digital twin of our production facility, providing insight in our actual capacity and uh, uh, enabling us to efficiently use our capacity. So for this specific presentation, uh, Tuchi will continue the presentation focusing on the bleed feed methodology. The bleed feed project is related to fermentation systems. So let me first provide you some background on fermentation. Fermentation is conducted in an equipment uh, called bioreactor. This is a stainless steel vessel. And inside this vessel, we first put some living cells. These cells could be a bacteria or viruses. And these cells are highly re-engineered to produce desired active ingredients. What you see on the left uh, represents uh, the, the basic evolution of fermentation over time. First, the cells go through a lag phase. Uh, during lag phase, the cells do not grow, but then they enter an exponential growth phase. So they start to grow exponentially. But after a certain point in time, they stop growing and they enter the stationary phase. So we have mainly two important phases, exponential growth phase and the stationary phase. Now, what is our business case for the bleed feed? Um, before we do the fermentation, we need to set up the bioreactor. Uh, for this setup, we first need to clean and sterilize the bioreactor. These setup activities uh, are very expensive and they are also very time consuming. They can take up to 25% of the total production costs and lead times. So there is a um, clearly a important business case here for reducing these setup activities. So one potential way for uh, reducing setups is the, um, the use of lead feed technology. Now, let me explain you the underlying idea beyond lead feed. Uh, in bleed feed, we aim to eliminate some of the intermediary setups. So when we do the bleed feed, we would first extract some fraction of uh, the biomass that already accumulated inside the bioreactor. We take uh, some part of it out. This is the bleed uh, part. And then we will feed uh, the remaining cells with a fresh medium. And that is the feed part. So when we do the bleed feed uh, multiple times, this is how your process would look like. And compared to current practice, there is a um, large room for improvement. Uh, so this is definitely a breakthrough technology to reduce um, processing lead times and costs. However, using bleed feed in current practice is not easy. There are several challenges. And these challenges are not related to life sciences beyond bleed feed, but they are related to operational uh, issues. The first challenge is related to timing. Timing is very important. Um, the bleed feed works only during the exponential growth phase. Otherwise, the bleed feed does not uh, work. However, we don't know when the exponential growth phase stops. And this uncertainty creates an important trade-off here. If we do the bleed feed too soon, then we do not get the best performance from the system. And if we do it too late, then we might miss the opportunity for doing the bleed feed. So managing this trade-off here is very important for success. But uh, managing this trade-off is not easy. For example, in 2015, MSD um, tried to implement bleed feed, but uh, it failed after a few attempts. And the main reason for failure is because they were either too soon or too late in doing the bleed feed. Um, a second important challenge here is the lack of accurate prediction models. In particular, there are several uh, kinetic models in life sciences, but they are deterministic and they are not equipped to capture the uncertainty uh, in this production environment. Um, another challenge is related to uncertainty in growth rate. For example, after we do the bleed feed, the cell growth rate could be higher or slower compared to the first cultivation. And uh, finally, we also have some regulatory constraints. For example, we can do the bleed feed only two or three times, depending on the specific applications. So these challenges um, lead to our main research questions. Our first research question is to un understand what is an optimum bleed feed policy? Uh, when should we do the bleed feed to maximize the total amounts of, uh, amount of biomass uh, produced uh, from the system? 
And our second research question is related to managerial implications. Uh, we wanted to quantify the added value, the impact of applying bleed feed on current practice. In particular, uh, MSD and other companies were questioning the potential benefits of bleed feeds because of the challenges that I described in the uh, previous slide. Now, to answer these research questions, uh, we have built a stochastic optimization model using Markov decision processes. This is a finite horizon discrete time model. We make decisions at um, decision epochs. Um, it could be every day, every hour, or every second, depending on the specific process. In our case, we make decisions every hour. Then in our state space, we capture three important components. The first one is the cultivation age, the age of the fermentation process. The second one is the growth rate of the cell culture. And the third one is the bleed feed count, how many times we did the bleed feed so far. Uh, in our model, we have two actions. We either continue the fermentation or we do the bleed feed. Now, uh, when we continue the fermentation, then we need to establish the state transitions for the system. To establish the state transitions, we went back to life sciences literature and uh, identified some relevant kinetic models. Uh, these kinetic models are heavily studied in life science and they capture the complex biological dynamics of fermentation processes. So we made use of that information. But one critical limitation uh, in life science is that uh, these kinetic models are typically deterministic and they do not capture the stochasticity uh, of these systems. And this is especially an important limitation because um, we have this uh, critical trade-off on bleed feed time and we need to, we needed to capture the uncertainty. So what we did was to first expand the existing kinetic models in life sciences uh, so that they can, um, uh, they, they become stochastic models. And once we did that model enhancement, then as a third layer in our model, uh, we linked these kinetic models with operational challenges and trade-offs. Uh, and we did so by using our reward structure and uh, our objective function. So in um, overall, our objective is to maximize the total expected biomass production by deciding uh, whether we want to continue the fermentation process or do the bleed feed. And when we uh, make these decisions, then the system's state is predicted by the uh, enhanced uh, kinetic models from life sciences. Now, um, we also quantified um, uh, and analyzed the structural results. Um, for example, we have shown that optimum policy has a control limit structure under some mild conditions. For example, on the x-axis, we have the cultivation age. On the y-axis, we have the growth rate, and depending on the state of the system, we have a simple policy uh, that could be implemented in practice. Uh, we, we can see whether it's continue, uh, we should continue or do the bleed fit. Uh, this policy structure was a little bit surprising for us because the underlying biological dynamics were very complex and they were nonlinear. So we were happy that the system eventually behaved because such um, behavior is important when we do the real world implementation. Now, I would like to elaborate a little bit on the innovative aspects of this work. Uh, the main innovation lies uh, in combining operations research with life sciences. For example, most of the existing research right now in this field are uh, through the kinetic models in life sciences. Uh, people are putting a lot of effort in understanding the biological dynamics uh, of these systems. But what we did here is to first layer, um, equip these kinetic models um, with, with uncertainty theory, uh, so that it can they can capture the uncertainties, the stochasticity of the system. And we also linked these biological dynamics with systems level dynamics, with operational challenges and trade-offs. And making this connection between system level and biology level was the unique contribution of our work. 
Um, and this has led to a hybrid model. Um, and this was the first successful implementation of bleed feed in the batch uh, fermentation process in the entire industry. So in that sense, uh, we were very happy to set the first example. And uh, I also want to um, mention that uh, applications of biomanufacturing is uh, still not very much studied by the OR community. For example, uh, when we typed the keyword biomanufacturing in informs journals, we could see only nine research papers uh, published so far in the entire informs uh, journals. And most of these papers were also related uh, to our previous work. So in that sense, uh, this is a highly innovative application um, that involves a lot of challenges, but also a lot of exciting opportunities. And with this project, we provide one of the first examples on how operations research can complement life sciences. So we're going to look back now at uh, the collaboration that we had at the, with the Techno University. Uh, we had a proactive data collection process, and it was a process in which we conducted several new experiments uh, on lab scale, but also we were able to perform eight industry scale in uh, experiments. Uh, besides those generation of new data with new experiments, we were also working uh, with a manually process to retrieve data from our process line, from our equipment, to make sure that we had all the available data uh, to be sure that we were making the right process and right decision tools. And uh, most of the uh, uh, tools have been implemented in our daily operations at MSD. So since 2017, we're using the rhythm wheel, the optim yield optimization uh, dashboard and tool uh, we are using since 2018. And the bleed feed we have implemented in 2020. And if we then look at the impact of which all of these tools have been generating, uh, throughout the fleet facility, we have a 97% higher output without any investments in capacity, without any investments in new equipment. So then we're looking with this uh, output to an additional revenue of 50 million annually. And this can be achieved by just the bleed feed tool, which has resulted in an 85% higher yield batch the yield optimization tool on which we have uh, a 50% higher yield per batch. And the rhythm wheel tool allowed to produce an extra batch a week, uh, week per line. So next to these uh, financial benefits and the supply benefits, uh, we have also some secondary benefits that we're really happy with because we are using the same capacity and same equipment on a netto basis. We actually are looking at a reduction of our CO2 footprint. And a, another secondary benefit that we uh, observed is that actually we are driving towards a more and more standardized process by, by looking at our processes from an operations research point of view. And this standardization of the process had a natural reduction in variability. So we were actually able to already tackle the variability addressed at the beginning of this presentation. So this was only uh, and, and the research conducted on one department. Um, but we're now looking in a broader perspective. So we're looking to see how we can get this implementation and this thought process going towards other process lines, other facilities within the Boxmere for, uh, facility. But also internationally, we are looking throughout the network how we can transfer this knowledge, how we can transfer these tools to make sure that we even further increase the, uh, the impact. Um, so one of the ways we're doing this is that we have uh, established a specific operation research team which are looking at this data-driven decision uh, throughout the network. So it's a global initiative. And um, in this initiative, we are also looking at our human health colleagues. So uh, for one part, how can we transfer our knowledge towards the human health industry as well? But on the other hand, the human health industry is also looking uh, to their own processes with this knowledge. And we are also looking at how can we then transfer that knowledge back to our industry as on a process point of view, the processes between human and animal health have quite some overlapping. So as a final note, I'd like to thank you for your attendance and for your interest. And uh, 
by continuing what we're doing, uh, we can and will make this world a better place.